We thank thee, O Lord, that we may draw nigh unto thee. It is a good thing for thy children to uh, approach thy throne of grace, to seek thy face and thy favor, and that we gather this day in the name of thy beloved Son, our dear Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that we are accepted in him, and in his name, therefore, we call upon thee, O Lord, to bless us, each one, in our infirmities and our difficulties. forgiving our sins, dealing with us not as we deserve in ourselves, but looking upon us with favor in the Lord Jesus Christ, and for his sake, really showing thy love to us, pouring out the riches of thy <coughs> grace and blessing upon us. And uh, so may we this day be able to live before thee with, with confidence, with trust, uh, with solid faith in the, the gospel message, with the uh, good hope of e- eternal life, with uh, Uh, delight in thy presence and thy spirit. Uh, Fulfill, therefore, the desires of our heart, the longings of our heart for fellowship with thee, O Lord. We had rather to be a doorkeeper in the house of our Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. We long to dwell in thy courts and to behold thy beauty. Show us thy beauty and thy grace uh, out of thy word, we pray thee this day. Strengthen us uh, uh, through our study of the scriptures. Build us up in the faith and equip us for the calling which is ours to preach the gospel. We thank thee for that calling. We pray for thy presence and equipping through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let's turn back to uh, the last of the passages we'll be dealing with messianic prophecies in the book of Genesis. That's the uh, final blessings of Jacob upon his sons are recorded in uh, Genesis 49, verses 8 and following. And we've made... Uh, our way through perhaps the heart of the passage, which is in, in the 10th verse, where we have the reference to uh, the common figure of, of Shiloh, and we have uh, discussed the different uh, possible ways of understanding that from the thought that it is a messianic uh, title derived from the verb Shalah, uh, and the associated noun Shalwa which has to do with the idea of peace and uh, prosperity and ease, sort of a synonym for shalom, uh, as we uh, noted in Psalm 122. And so that is one view uh, that we would then translate uh, Genesis 49, verse 10, that not shall the scepter depart from Judah, nor the ruling staff from between his feet, until that uh, Shiloh should come, and then we would understand Shiloh as a messianic designation, bringing out the aspect of him that uh, would bring out the thought that he is uh, the, the, the Prince of Peace. Uh, the pre- preceding verses have brought out the aspect of, of the Messiah uh, as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, but he's also the Prince of Peace. Uh, he's the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and that indeed is the, the thrust of the prophecy that the days were uh, uh, coming when, when Judah would rise to preeminence uh, uh, among uh, the brethren within the tribes of Israel. And uh, preeminence in the sense of, of actual royalty is signified then by the scepter, the shavit, and by the michokek, the uh, ruler's staff. So that, of course, was indeed fulfilled in uh, God's calling and setting aside of David and in the making of the Davidic covenant, Second Samuel 7, was in fulfillment uh, of what we have here. And you study those, that passage together with this, and you get the picture of the coming messianic king as the one whose uh, reign would be universal. And uh, so in terms of the two motifs of all messianic prophecy, the, the, the sufferings and, and the glory, the, the early part then of this blessing on the tribe of Judah uh, underscores uh, the, the glory that's associated with the coming messianic uh, Shiloh figure. And uh, as we move beyond verse 10, we'll be seeing that there are at least some some hints uh, that uh, in all, all probability this should be understood as in indications of, of, of the sufferings so that we're going to be there too. We'll have to look at the language and see what justification there is for that. But meanwhile, then, the, there is the Shiloh title there in, in verse 10. Uh, and uh, along with that option, which is the one I said I was favoring, <coughs> that it should be understood as signifying something equivalent to shalom, peace, prosperity, 
Uh, there were the other views, uh, some of them uh, reflected in the NIV translation, the, the, their preferential the translation in the text itself, uh, which was uh, until he comes, uh, uh, what was it again, until he comes to whom tribute belongs? Whom it belongs. Uh, how does it go again? Until he comes to whom it belongs. Uh, until he comes to whom it belongs. And uh, we, we, we saw the, the basis uh, for that in, in the apparent uh, allusion, obvious allusion to it in, in the Ezekiel passage, and uh, where uh, Ezekiel predicts uh, then the, the exile. He's, he's speaking right on, the, on, on the, the brink of the situation where the Davidic covenant, yes, the, this had been fulfilled. Judah had come to the, the headship in the person of David, and, and the Davidic covenant assured an ongoing a dynasty, in fact, fact, a perpetual one, however, at, at the, the anti-typical level. Meanwhile, at the typical level, the, the Davidic dynasty was just about to come to an end, and Ezekiel predicts that, a ruin, a ruin, a ruin, a make it take off the curve and take off uh, the, the, the crown. Things aren't going to be the same anymore, Ezekiel says, and uh, this is the way it's going to be until that one comes which to him belongs the mishpat, the judgment, is the way uh, Ezekiel put it. So he evidently, uh, as the, then also the, the Septuagint translators uh, did, we notice, uh, Ezekiel seems then to take the, the shilo as uh, consisting of the relative pronoun asher, in the abbreviated form sheh, and uh, the preposition namad and the phenomenal suffix, so that which to him, instead of one name, shilo, it would be a composite uh, meaning which to him, uh, and uh, so <coughs> Ezekiel then uh, certainly alludes to, to uh, uh, Genesis 49, and the only question is I, I would regard it uh, uh, as a, a wordplay that he's punning on the name Shiloh, and uh, others would regard it as a, with the, having the intention to bring out the actual etymology of, of the thing. So at, at the NIV, the translator, so you know, I can understand and sympathize, with, with their preference for that uh, that understanding uh, of it, then uh, along with their their reference to the uh, view that I'm adopting in, in a, a footnote, they also footnoted uh, the possibility uh, which had the word tribute in it. Well, how, how does that one go then? Right, until he comes to whom tribute. Belongs. Oh yes, until he comes to whom tribute uh, 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 belongs, uh, and. Uh, that was based uh, on taking the sheen at the beginning of Shiloh, not as the relative pronoun, but as uh, the, the, the word she, uh, that meaning tribute. And uh, so, uh, so uh, th th that's how they came up uh, with uh, the, the, that particular. We, we, we mentioned some other options, uh, Akkadian word meaning a ruler and so on, and a variety of other opinions. Uh, but. Uh, uh, which any one of the NIV translations would be uh, compatible with uh, understanding this as a messianic figure, just be bringing out some some different aspect uh, of that figure. And on my reading, the the, the peaceful nature of, of his reign and his accomplishment on on the the other renderings, it would be pointing to uh, his royal prerogatives. So he is the one. Uh, uh, to whom, uh, to, to use Ezekiel's term, the mishpat, the judgment, the, the judicial prerogative uh, uh, belongs, or in terms of, of this, he is the one to whom the, the, the royal tribute uh, belongs. So uh, on any of these views, uh, the, then uh, uh, verse uh, 10, and uh, the prophecy of the Shiloh, he is the eschatological coming one, and that of course is important, he is the one who is to come, a uh, conspicuous messianic uh, feature uh, so, so much so that, for example, the scholar Movinkel in, in developing uh, the, the book on the Messianic prophecies entitled He That Cometh, He That Cometh, The Coming One. Uh, uh, Voss, for example, when he is analyzing the concept of messiahship, lists as one of, of five features the, the, this, that he is the eschatological coming uh, one. So, Messiah is that one who is the object of anticipation, expectation, and longing. We, we wait for his coming. He, that was Israel's perspective, and still it, it is ours as we look for his second coming. And, and uh, this all then has uh, to, to do with uh, the glory of the Messiah, the coming majestic royal 
figure who will hold the scepter and to whom there will be a universal uh, dominion and whether that's the right translation uh, of it or not. Tribute, he, he is the one to whom universal tribute uh, and reverence and worship truly belongs. So until he comes, until Shiloh comes, and to him will be the obedience of the peoples, the Amin. And so we notice here that it's, it goes beyond just that the, that the 12 brothers of the, the Israelite tribes will bow down to him. The Amim are the peoples of the Gentiles uh, out there, which then, of course, picks up on our earlier, uh, y the earlier universal theme we saw, in, especially in, uh, in uh, Noah's uh, oracles concerning his son, and especially his oracle concerning uh, Japheth when he spoke about uh, the made God open it wide, the, the covenant tents, uh, uh, so that the Japhethites might come in. A uh, theme then that, uh, of course, picked up in the Abrahamic covenant promises that all the nations will be blessed in him. And uh, here it's echoed still further. All of the, the nations blessed by him, coming to him, uh, will, uh, will reverence uh, him. Well, then moving beyond <coughs> that, as I say, we, we have the more cryptic, difficult uh, imagery of, of the, the closing verses of this oracle. And uh, beginning then with verse 11, it speaks about uh, binding to the vine, the row, his donkey. <coughs> and then in parallelism with it, uh, and to the choice vine, instead of Iro, it now has the, the, the parallel is Bino Atono. And uh, so the, the osiri, the, the verb, does, uh, does double duty. Uh, in the, the second clause, there's an ellipsis of it, but the osiri does double duty. So, so binding to the vine, his donkey, yes, binding to the choice vine, uh, the the ass's uh, colt, uh, and uh, so there's that particular imagery. And let's just translate the rest and then pick up on some of the details and problems. Kibes uh, washing. Hmm? Now we get the, the, the imagery of the stained, <coughs> blood-stained uh, garments. Washing the yayan in wine, his vesture, and then as a synonym for the, the wine, the blood of the grapes and the choice of the, the dam as blood will be one of those esoteric hints, uh, something to do with suffering here. Huh? Washing in wine his garment, Yes, and again, the verb doing <coughs> double duty, washing in the blood of grapes, uh, his, his vesture. And then finally, and, and, and still mysterious, darkness of eyes. And now we have miyayan, and we have a choice of translating the preposition min as a comparative or as uh, the source or cause, his eyes are, are, are dark with wine or are, are darker than wine. And uh, then whiteness literally of teeth, once again, from drinking milk or teeth that are whiter than milk. So uh, the, there, there is uh, the, that imagery. Now, does all of this have to do simply with the fact that Messiah's reign is uh, not only universal, but it is uh, as uh, various passages like Psalm 72 or Isaiah 11 would bring out, the Messiah's reign is a time of universal prosperity. Mm -hmm. uh, amazing fruitfulness uh, uh, attends the messianic reign. That, that certainly is a common uh, messianic theme. It, it would be then a continuation of the glory uh, the, the theme of, of the preceding uh, verses. He will have a he will be a glorious king, universal reign, prosperity uh, attending. It would, it would uh, tie in rather well, I suppose, with understanding Shiloh in terms of, of, of shalom and, and peace uh, in, in his time. And whatever there, there is a, of a suggestion of, of, well, it would be like a new creation uh, theme being worked in. It would be paradise regained huh? when Messiah comes, sorry. Uh, the, the second Adam, uh, he will uh, 
restore what was lost in Adam, of course, more than restore, he will consummate it. But yes, it will be, it will be paradise restored, indeed paradise uh, and consummated. Uh, uh, the, the, that would all be very uh, uh, appropriate. Uh, but uh, yet there's a, a, a hint or two here that I think we have to pay attention to. And, 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 uh, and I don't think we have done full weight to the, the uh, analogy of scripture evidence. And if we fail to recognize that there is a suggestion uh, that there will be the, the sufferings uh, of the Messiah uh, involved uh, along with his glory. Now, one of those uh, suggestions then right away has to do with the, uh, with the particular term that is used for the animal that is bound uh, to the vine. The, the, the vine, you know, you, you might just take this, uh, you, you, the things are so luxuriant and, and fruitful. <coughs> the, the, the grapevines are, uh, are going so great that you don't have to worry about damaging uh, the, them. You, you can just hit your critter to, to, the, to the vine. So, prosperous are, but is that all that is uh, intended here? I, I think not. Uh, so we, we have this designation. Uh, it, it's split into two parts, I guess, here in the first uh, in the first uh, stick of the line. It uh, has uh, uh, the the ear row from, from uh, the word ear, a donkey with the suffix, but almost suffix. So there, there is a ear row, and, and then in the second part, there's the bene I don't know. And put together, then you get the phrase which uh, has picked up, as we'll see in a few minutes in, in Zechariah 9, comes out to Ayer Ben Atanot. Ayer Ben Atanot, a donkey, a colt of the Shiasis. And uh, so the, the, that's the, the phrase that catches our eye because of its, uh, its special character uh, <coughs> found here, found again in Zechariah 9, as we said and uh, the two passages which uh, form the background for what we come upon in the Gospel accounts of the uh, triumphal entry of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on, on uh, the, uh, the, the donkey. And as uh, you'll probably recall my mentioning it in other connections, maybe in the Pentateuch class, I usually make some reference when we're talking about the uh, Near Eastern backgrounds for various uh, covenantal documentary and ratification uh, customs in, in, in the Bible and I, I, I mentioned how there uh, is a, a text that comes from the location of Mari, M-A-R-I, Mari on the upper Euphrates from about the 18th century of B.C. in which a, a, a suzerain has sent his uh, lieutenant uh, to to supervise a, a, a covenant ratification ceremony and it's been done and now the, the servant, the, the royal servant is reporting back that he's done it and he tells how in, in uh, the, the ceremony attending this, this, this uh, covenanting that has been uh, uh, organized between two of the vassals uh, that he took a, a, a certain kind of an animal and I, uh, the cognate term for the Hebrew, I ayer ben atanot so that's a very striking thing when you were making the covenant and you were killing the animal to symbolize the curse that would overtake you if you broke the covenant and then a, a stipulated type of animal was this particular whatever particular special breed is, is signified by Ayer Ben Atanot it was some special breed of, of, of donkey and it was this kind uh, that would appropriately, properly <coughs> qualified to, to serve as the covenant donkey, as the, the covenant whose the shedding of whose blood would uh, ratify uh, the, the covenant. And against that background, uh, that, that, that particular uh, descriptive uh, the title of this, this animal in, in, in our text, and again then in, in the Zechariah 9 passage, and then again in the, in, in, in the gospel account of the triumphal entry, uh, suggest so, so that that's what we should see. We should see that this particular donkey uh, is uh, associated, or the Messiah is associated here with, with a donkey which was uh, known for its role in shedding its blood in order to ratify a covenant. And of course then uh, takes on 
own new rich meaning uh, as we, we see it picked up in Zechariah 9 and in the uh, account of Jesus' triumphal entry, which we will uh, say then, you know, a bit more about when we, we uh, uh, look at Zechariah 9. But there then is, is one hint uh, that that special terminology for the donkey is one hint uh, that there's the way to glory is going to be through the way of shedding the, the blood to ratify the new covenant. The Lord becomes the Lord. He qualifies to become the Lord of the new covenant uh, uh, through this particular means of, of shedding the blood of, of uh, the, the covenant. Well then, any other hints of, of uh, possibility of, of suffering here? Um, in the second line uh, of uh, verse uh, 11, washing in wine his garments and in the blood of grapes his, his vesture. And uh, as we said already, and tying in with this covenant donkey who sheds its blood <laughs> to ratify a covenant, now the explicit reference to the word blood here and uh, associated with with wine and uh, what is the symbolism now? Very strange symbolism of uh, cleansing garments in what we would normally think of that which would stain garments, which are uh, the grape, the, the blood of the grape in, in either one, the, 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 the wine or, or the, the blood either then would not be uh, uh, the natural thing you would use to, to suggest a detergent, a cleansing, it's, it's, uh, it's something that would stain, and yet in this case, uh, it speaks about a, a, a washing uh, and, uh, uh, of the garments in the wine and, and in uh, the blood. Now, as, as you, you try to unravel that elsewhere in the Bible, you're confronted with the two possibilities. One, uh, where you had the, a, a divine figure with blood-stained garments, huh? And uh, in some of the context uh, then suggests that, that, that this would be more of the theme of glory. Where is it that God stains his garments uh, uh, as an expression of, of his wrath, huh? <coughs> as a, a tra trampling of, of the wine press? Uh, uh, flip over maybe quickly to Isaiah. Uh, 63. Isaiah 63 is, is one of the passages where, where the Lord is seen as the divine warrior who is going forth on his day of vengeance. And there was none other as he looks around to do it, and so he himself goes, goes forth uh, uh, to, to battle, and uh, now he is, is seen. Returning and and you, you you sort of have the the reciprocal questions put out by the the, the witness of his coming and then the Lord answers it back and forth like that a sort of an antiphonal type of of thing uh, Isaiah sixty three who is this Misa who comes from Edom his garments crimson who is this who is Hador, or who is glorious uh, in his vesture the one who comes striding in the strength of his might so there is there is the the, uh, the scene of the divine warrior majestically uh, proceeding from uh, the, the site and then there there is his own answer to it who, who is this that comes with these uh, uh, crimson stained uh, garments I am the one uh, I who speak in righteousness uh, I who am mighty to save so there's the Lord's answer he identifies himself he is the one who comes down with these stained uh, garments and then the question uh, how did your garments uh, get stained Madua verse 2 why is your vesture all red and your garments uh, like someone Dorik, the God who has been trampling in the wine press. Hmm? And uh, the, end, the answer of the Lord comes back again in verse 3. The wine press I have trodden alone. 
and of the peoples, there was no one with me in this great day of his vengeance and working of, of, of uh, salvation. There was no one with me, and I trod them in my anger, and I trampled them in my wrath. And the last line there in verse 3, and Nitzham, their blood, their, their light blood, sprinkled Yates, my garments, and all my vesture I stained. So there is the uh, familiar picture, more familiar from passage uh, we can take a look at in the book of Revelation, uh, of the Lord as uh, the, the one who tramples the winepress of wrath. It's a picture of final judgment, the staining his garments with the, the blood of, uh, of, of his enemies. And uh, so that indeed is one possibility here of the, of the submitting of, of the garments uh, to the effect of, uh, of uh, wine and, and uh, blood. And in Revelation, they, you get that motif picked up, but you, you also get another one. I guess it's in Revelation 19. That would be the context we'd expect the idea of vengeance. Revelation 19, verses uh, 13 and so. Revelation 19, the passage of the messianic rider on the white horse as he, he comes in final judgment with the priestly armies of, of heaven uh, with him to make uh, war with justice he judges and makes war his eyes are like blazing fire on his head are many crowns so this is another royalty glory uh, episode and uh, he has a name written on him uh, this translation says that no one knows but he himself uh, I suggest that the right translation there is uh, not that no, no one knows but he himself, but that no one owns but he himself. As a matter of fact, we, we know the name that is written there, told us in the context. Uh, but the thought is that he alone has a right to the he alone. It's the one who has won this uh, name which is written on him. So I suggest that uh, that's a better way to translate. He has a name written on him that, that belongs, belongs, belongs to no one uh, but he himself. But now verse 13 is the one uh, on our point. Uh, he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. So uh, dipped in, in, in blood is the uh, <coughs> thought, and uh, the, uh, then uh, elaborating on, on, on that uh, in verse uh, 15, uh, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And uh, let's see, it's uh, that same imagery, I guess, is in the end of Revelation 14, uh, where you have the dual sign of, of, of uh, the, the parousia judgment in terms of uh, the gathering of, of the harvest, but also the, the gathering of the vintage of, of uh, wrath and uh, uh, yeah, in Revelation 14, the angel swung his sickle on the earth, verse 19, gathered its grapes and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city. Blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles were a distance of 1,600 stadia. So there, there is one way in, in which this imagery of Genesis 49 then could be understood, uh, that, that is that the Messiah we will be engaged in, in, in judgment and uh, tying it in with the mother promise in Genesis uh, uh, 3.15 uh, he is the one who crushes the head of the serpent and when he crushes the head of the serpent then the, the blood of the, the serpent uh, is, is stains uh, uh, stains the, the Messiah's uh, uh, garments so that, that that is one possibility now however uh, there's the other possibility, uh, and very directly suggested by the use of the verb kavas, to wash, huh? <coughs> wash, and uh, that this, this blood, this, this uh, wine is supposed to have a, a cleansing uh, effect uh, uh, somehow, and uh, that would be uh, uh, in view in uh, the other passage in Revelation we wanted to look at, which was Revelation 7, verse 14.
Revelation 7 would be then the, the dual vision of, of the people of God, first in terms more of prophetic idiom, Old Testament imagery of, of uh, the 144,000, the 12,000 from each of the, the tribes, and that's the, 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 the first part of uh, Revelation 7, but then the vision is doubled, and in, in uh, the, the second part, beginning with verse uh, 8 or 9, uh, it's uh, the, the co covenant community, the redeemed, are, are described in more straightforward New Testament terms, and not so much in the Old Testament imagery of the 12 tribes, but in the reality of a multitude from all of the nations, and from every tribe, nation, people, and language standing before the throne in front of the Lamb, and they were wearing these white robes and holding palm branches and so on. And verse 14, was it? Uh, yeah, I, the question is asked, then one of the elders asked me, asked John, these in the white robes, uh, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have come out of the New Testament age of, of the great commission preaching, which is an age when the saints suffer uh, for their faithfulness in preaching, uh, the, fulfilling the Great Commission. So the church age is simultaneously the age of the Great Commission and the age of the Great Tribulation. These two things uh, go together. They've come out of that. They're, they're, they're in heaven now. They're, they're in the church triumphant, no longer down in the, the church militant where martyrs are, are made. But uh, the, they are there and uh, they've come out of the great tribulation and they have, now it's washed, hmm? not stained their garments uh, in the expression of, of, of vengeance, but they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. And it's uh, hard to divorce that, uh, to fail to see that as an allusion uh, to these other passages, in particular to the Genesis. 49 passage, and uh, as, as elaborated, we'll see in, in, in Zechariah uh, 9 as well. And uh, so I think uh, there there is a, a strong hint that, that back in Genesis 49, uh, uh, there's something of the idea of of the sufferings, the shedding of the blood to uh, to to cleanse uh, his people. Uh, as well as the, the uh, shedding of the, the blood of the enemies. And, you know, those two things, uh, again, looking at Genesis 3.15, belong r r right, right together. In, in, in the act of, of the seed of the woman trampling with his heel upon the head of the serpent, the blood is flowing from both directions. Huh? And the Messiah, so the, the blood of his heel is flowing. Hmm? But also the, the blood of the serpent is uh, 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 flowing as as uh, he is stamped upon, and uh, and so there's a, a combination of the, the, the two kinds of, of, of blood staining here, one for vengeance, one shedding the blood, which is the basis then of the reconciliation, atonement for, for the rest of the, the seed of the woman. Well, now, beyond that, uh, the closing verse, verse 12, uh, darkness of eyes from wine or whiteness of, of teeth uh, uh, from, from milk. Uh, perhaps we, we, we should settle here at the, 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 the end uh, for the, the theme of, uh, of the paradise restored here and uh, the, the, that motif comes in, whatever element of suffering was in the preceding verse. Messiah's reign is one where he brings back a land flowing with milk and honey and wine. And uh, so, so perhaps that's the way to understand uh, verse 12. But putting the whole thing together then, uh, uh, Jacob predicts from the line of Judah the coming of eschatologically of the Messianic king, prince of peace, who will bring judgment on the enemy, crush the serpent's head, and in, in this way bring salvation, uh, forgiveness, cleansing to his people, an age of, of a universal prosperity. Confirming, from confirming our whole hermeneutical approach now to this passage and, uh, and bringing out the, the, 
the, the continuity and the unity of, of the biblical revelation concerning the Messiah over a period of, of hundreds of years now from, from uh, Jacob uh, down to Zechariah. Uh, let's turn now to Zechariah 9. And I think whatever tentativeness we uh, might have had in, in reaching our conclusions in Genesis 49, uh, Zechariah 9 will uh, uh, help us to have a little more assurance that we have been on the right track here. This is a great chapter from from various points of, of view which is uh, helpful in uh, bringing out things we should be aware of in, in exegesis of uh, the prophets. Uh, you know, the, the prophets look ahead to the Messianic age and uh, the new covenant unfolds in two stages. We had something of this in, in, uh, when we looked at Jeremiah 31, which was a new covenant prophecy. And uh, you know, the question of whether certain things that Jeremiah predicted concerning that new covenant had to do with the period of the church age, or whether it had to do with the consummation. And we have a mixture of it. And, and uh, from our perspective, we can see the difference uh, between the two stages, and uh, we can uh, uh, determine a little e easier the, the sequence uh, of these features that characterize the New Covenant. But within the, the, the prophets themselves, uh, they sort of see the whole thing as so one package, and, and they will go back and forth, the, not just from this to this, but from the future stage to, to our, our present uh, church stage. And uh, Zechariah 9 is a good example of that. It begins, the, the opening eight verses or so in, in Zechariah 9 are a picture of, of uh, the new conquest. Mm -hmm. Israel went into the land, they conquered the land, Joshua led them in, and then they conquered the, the Canaanites and so on, took possession of, of the land, mm -hmm. fine. But Zechariah 1 through 9, speaks about a new day when there will be a new conquest and this time the Lord himself will uh, perform the role of, of uh, Joshua he will he will lead the conquest and where does that fit into uh, the, the messianic age uh, of course uh, it belongs with with stage two with the introduction to stage two with the final judgment of what we were just looking at in Revelation uh, 14 and then Revelation, uh, Revelation uh, the 19, it's the, 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 the final judgment scene, the conquest of the world, the dispossessing of universally of, of, of the Canaanites in order to make the whole world, the whole cosmos available uh, to be enjoyed by the, the people of, of God. So that's the, the opening uh, nine verses, and uh, or eight verses. And then in the passage we want to concentrate on now, verses nine and following, you come back, so you backtrack. You, you've dealt with that, that future, uh, but now what he has to say about the Messiah has to do with the, with the cross and, and with the preaching of the gospel, speaking peace to the nations and so on. And, uh, and uh, so you were at this point, you go back to this point, and then before you're done with the passage, you, you come back to the second stage, the consummation stage, the, the theme of paradise and, and again. So as I say, from our vantage point, we can look and, and we can see the different moments in eschatology and we can arrange them in their proper uh, order. So let's look at uh, Zechariah 9. And uh, um, yeah, at and, and verse 9. All right. It's uh, rather like the passage, I guess we read the other day, didn't we, in Isaiah 54, where the, 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 the call went out to sing and to break forth into, into song because more were going to be the children of the desolate woman than of, uh, the, the, uh, than of the, the, the married one. Well, here again, there's, a, there's an exhortation out to break forth joyfully, uh, rejoice, oh, exceedingly, and the, the call goes out now to what is called Batsion, the, the daughter Zion, evidently, of the, uh, usually understood as the population of, of, 
of the city. The people of, of Zion uh, rejoice. And then in parallelism with Gili, it's Harii, shout aloud, and now instead of daughter Zion, it's daughter Jerusalem. So the, the center, the capital, the focus, uh, a place of, uh, of God's people is to rejoice. Uh, and the reason now is in terms of the coming of their king. Rejoice because, Hine, behold, Malchik, your king. Your king, Yavo, Lach. Now here is the idea then of Genesis 49, 10, until Shiloh, you know, the same verb, Bo, comes. He is the coming one. Your king is the coming one, and the one you've been waiting for since Genesis 49, 10, and, and before that, the, the coming one, he has come. Huh? Rejoice now in the fulfillment of the messianic expectation. Behold, your king comes to you. And now, what is his uh, uh, character? What is his uh, nature? And I would suggest there's a lot here that shows that he is Shiloh. He is uh, Shiloh, the, the, the prince of, of peace, uh, uh, the one who, who brings uh, prosperity and so on to his people and, and to Jerusalem. And as the Psalm 122 was expressing it. Behold, your king comes to you, and he is righteous, Zadik. He is righteous. Now notice the next word. The next word is no shah. The root, of course, is the verb from which we get the name of Joshua Jesus, saving Yasha. But now what is the form? What is the form with the, with the uh, nun preformative, of course, signalizing a nifal? And uh, so we have here a nifal participle, and what normally is the significance of the nifal? Well, of course, passive. Now our traditional translation is that of this is that he comes righteous and at least King James was having salvation. What does the NIV do? I don't know what the NIV does with that. Having salvation. Having salvation. Having salvation. All right, but now how do you get that out, out of a, the, out of a passive, well, which uh, more strictly is he comes as one who is righteous and as one who is saved. He is righteous. And no who he and he is he is saved. Uh, the the imagery here is uh, we're back in Genesis three fifteen again, and uh, the, the the there's the holy war of the ages, and it began with the woman enmity between you and the woman, which would be continued your seed and her seed until the climactic battle, and the, the climactic battle we suggested was one of a. Of a a duel of champions, a, a trial by ordeal. In the final hour of, of the ultimate conflict, uh, God would render the verdict, and the verdict would be rendered as, as the two armies were represented, each by his champion, the David and the Goliath, and meet one another. And uh, in a trial by ordeal, the, the, the principle is uh, that uh, there is a rendering of a divine judgment. Human sources of, of judicial discrimination the fail, they, they can't settle the thing, and so there is resort uh, to deity uh, to intervene uh, through some ordeal agency or, or through combat between the, the, the rival claimants in the, the situation, and it's more that that we have to do with here. So here are, are the rival claimants, uh, here is Christ and, 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 and the dragon, uh, here is the ultimate Armageddon. Uh, battle and and in, in this battle is, is it Christ or or Satan that is going to prevail? God renders the verdict as, as they they meet in combat and and the outcome is that a verdict of Zadik righteous is is rendered in, in behalf of your king. Rejoice because your king is the one who emerges uh, from this ordeal combat with the verdict of righteousness and in the ordeal uh, the. the right party was given the, the verdict of, of, of righteous and the guilty party was, was, was condemned with, with the uh, equivalent uh, uh, verdict and so the, the, the verdict of, of, of victory, there was a verdict of being in the right, of being Zadik, God renders in behalf of, of uh, his servant your king in the resurrection there is the vindication, there is, is the word of approbation which is, is pronounced by, by heaven and and, and sealed by the resurrection and the ascension and, and, and the assigning of glory uh, to the Messiah. Yes, there is that, 
uh, that the glory, and of course the glory comes as we see precisely because he has been uh, the one who has suffered. But yes, he, he is the Zadik one. And now we can understand, I think, the pass of Nosha. He is the one who is delivered from the ordeal. The ordeal is mortal combat in, in which uh, everything is at, at stake, at, at risk. And, uh, and uh, your king is the one who will emerge from, from <coughs> that mortal combat. He will have had, we know, the, his, the, the healing of the wound, but he will have crushed the serpent's head. He will emerge as the one who is delivered uh, from this mortal combat. And of course, it is only because he, he does and that he is the one who is saved in this hour of judgment and receives the, the, the endorsement of, of, of God that he is in a position to save others and therefore the NIV and, and Old King James uh, version are, aren't so bad after all in terms of their ultimate meaning. Huh? Uh, it's just that uh, you don't get there quite as directly, I don't think, as their translation. I think it takes an understanding of this ordeal background to understand uh, uh, how you do get there. So he is the one who is de delivered, who is declared righteous, and now he is the one uh, who can, through his administration of the new covenant, share the, the blessings. He can mediate the blessings which he has merited in terms of his relationship uh, uh, to the commission of the Father. Well, going on then, rejoice, uh, your king comes to you, righteous and however you want to translate it then, uh, victorious, uh, d delivered, uh, is he also afflicted, hmm? afflicted. And now here we come to our friend the Dark Covenant donkey, all right? And afflicted and rochev al Habor, yes, uh, well, al ayr ben atanot. So we also have the word Hamor thrown into the formula, he's a donkey. And then in this, uh, it's synonymous with that is the combination of what we had in the two parts of uh, Genesis 49, the ayer at one side and the benatanot on the other. And here they come together here. And uh, yes, riding upon an ayer benatanot upon this uh, uh, donkey colt. And we've then I think explained what, what that signifies. And when therefore the, the, this thought is fulfilled, this prophecy is fulfilled in the triumphal entry, the significance of Jesus riding on this donkey should be appreciated as involving something more than his humility and something more than just uh, the, the fact that he comes as a Shiloh bringing uh, peace, as a prince of peace. Uh, something more than that is, uh, is the, the way in, in which he qualifies to speak peace to the nations, namely he, he is the one who sheds the blood of the the covenant. He, he comes riding on the covenant donkey, signifying what was his real purpose that day in his moving into uh, uh, in, in Jerusalem. And further supporting that then is uh, what, what follows here in verses 10 and following in Zechariah 9, where we have uh, a, a picture now here. Here's the cross. And as a result of his work on the cross, and then there is a great commission and uh, the, he is able to come before the nations of the world and, and, and to offer reconciliation with the Father. He's able now to, to call those who are in rebellion against the, 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 the covenant suzerain of heaven and earth. He's calling them to bow the knee and to submit the, to him to, to enter into this uh, covenant of, of peace. Now that's what we are up to, is it not, in our preaching of the gospel? And uh, so it reads, and, Verse 10, uh, he will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and uh, the, the horse from Jerusalem. Now, as I said, in the opening, uh, in the opening eight verses of, of Zechariah 9, we're all military. God's going to come forth uh, in, in a great military campaign, a new Joshua, a new conquest, a great new holy war, and, and dispossess uh, the, the people of, of the world and, and take over his uh, domain for his own people. Now you get a complete reversal of, of, of that, and uh, there's total disarmament. Uh, there's total disarmament of God's people, and uh, the presence of military weaponry is, is removed from them. Well, we'll see it before the, this chapter is over that we'll, we'll be back to total, total armament again. Hmm? 
we'll be back to where we were in verses 1 through 8 before the chapter is over, but, but right here, it's total disarmament. So the chariot uh, I will uh, cut off from Ephraim, and the horse from Jerusalem, and the Keshet Milchama, the battle bull, will be cut off, and Deber Shalom Lagoim, okay? So military equipment will be removed, Messiah will, will, will assume the stance of one who comes offering reconciliation and, and uh, an opportunity to enter into the peace of the covenant uh, uh, with the, the Lord. He will speak shalom to the goyim. And uh, insofar as we have here, as we certainly do, uh, reflections back upon that prophecy in Genesis 49, I would see this reference to shalom as uh, something of a, a support for understanding Shiloh then uh, from that word shala, which stands in synonymous relationship to shalom in, in Psalm 122, as we saw. And he will speak uh, peace uh, to the nations. Let's, uh, let's take our break right at that point and come back.